Welcome to the Conscious Community Podcast, brought to you by Conscious Community Magazine. I'm your host, Janae. And I'm Spencer. This episode, we had an in-depth conversation with highly regarded visual artist Michael Reedy. Reedy's work has been widely exhibited throughout the world and has received numerous prestigious awards. We discuss how art heals, how it teaches us to think, and how it shows us who we are. Uh, Michael Reedy, welcome to the Conscious Community Podcast. Hello. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing excellent. You just did a gallery show, is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had several shows up across the, the country over the past year. I have several more coming up, so it's been busy time. Where was your last show at? Um, the last thing that just came down would have been the two-person show out in uh, San Francisco. And then, of course, I have a solo show that that opened just this past week in, at Bloomsburg University. Um, and then I'm currently working on another solo show that's going to open at a gallery um, uh, called Helicon in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, at the start of the new year. So cool. all sorts of things sort of in the mix. Yeah, when we were trying to schedule with you, you had a lot going on. I was looking over your... Uh your resume and your uh, galleries on the website last night. And I was like, holy cow, this guy gets all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I've had a good, a good run. And then there's just been a lot of invitationals kind of uh, popping up here and there where people, you know, say, Hey, you know, we have this group show going on. Would you, you know, contribute a piece? And uh, so, yeah, the, the last few years have been, um, a lot different, you know, before I used to have to do, do a lot of the legwork myself, I guess, tracking down shows, contacting galleries, you know, applying for things. Uh, and I sort of, uh, hit this turn in the road evidently where, where now I'm being sought out a lot more than I'm seeking things out. So I, I couldn't be, uh, any happier about that sort of change, you know, because it makes it a lot easier when, when people are giving you opportunities instead of always having to fight for them. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Um, so for our, our listeners, uh, just to familiarize, uh, I actually, I went to NIU, uh, for a while back, uh, in the mid 2000s. I think I was there like 2003, 2006. And I had you for uh drawing class at that time. And I, I was, I just remember being really impressed with the work of yours that, that I saw. And I think this was before it was all on the web. So I may have just seen like a few examples of it, but I've since like looked you up a few times and kind of kept track of what was going on with your career. Like, and it's, I've just always been very, very impressed with your work and, uh, you're an amazing professor, drawing professor. And I just kind of always had you in the back of my head as somebody, you know, if I ever did something like, like this, uh, podcast that I would want to talk to you about, uh, because you just have such a wealth of knowledge. I just got so much out of your classes and, um, it's uh the art world's maybe a little less visible than like say like writing a lot of our other guests have been authors uh the the general public doesn't necessarily like isn't necessarily totally aware of like the art world the way they are like you know the writers or comedians or other other mediums um Mm -hmm. but uh i think there's a really important dialogue that goes on the art world that that uh, affects things and people are perhaps unaware of that, you know, cause it is so kind of invisible, like the visual arts have been, uh, like 2d visual still art has been really de-emphasized, I think in popular culture, you know, you just don't see is about the only, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to make a YouTube channel of a, a single static image, you know, people, <laughs> people aren't going to uh, tune in probably for, uh, um, you know, just, yeah, I mean, that's always been the, the, the downfall supposedly, right. Of, of painting or photography or 2d art like that in general, in the sense that, you know, uh, I, I read a book by James Elkins called the history of, uh, or pictures and tears. And I think it was like the history of paintings people have cried in front of. And there's only a few, <laughs> there's like, uh, Caravaggio's Bacchus and mainly for the sort of, um, uh, homosexual undertones and sort of the, the, the persecution of people. And they would, you know, sort of openly weep in front of that, that painting. But at the same time, you know, you could have someone go see Toy Story, 
you know, three or, or four, or whatever number they're on now. Uh, and, you know, the, they, they get the visuals, the music, you know, uh, all of these things sort of all wrapped together, and you have a whole audience of people crying. You know, and I think, you know, making a painting that, that has a lot of, you know, emotional weight to it um, is really difficult when, when you have somebody that can, like, pull on those, those different emotions uh, uh, through so many different um, inputs, I guess, so many, you know, they can, they can tap into experience in a much more immediate way. So, yeah, I, it is a lot harder to get your images out. Of course, Instagram and things like that makes it really easy to share 2D, you know, images because that's almost what the platform solely exists on. But, yeah, it's a different world. I was going to mention that Instagram because, I actually, I found you on Instagram because I saw you in Juxtapose before Spencer told me about you. So Yeah, that was uh, when I suggested uh, you as a guest and I uh, – told her to look you up. She was like, oh, I've seen this guy before. Yeah, I think I'm already subscribed to his Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I remember, like, I don't know, it was probably, it was after I started teaching at Eastern. I had a student who knew all of my work, and, and she said to me one day that I was Tumblr famous. And I didn't have any clue what that meant, you know, because I, you know, I didn't really participate in Tumblr and things like that. I mean, I had my website dating way back to, like, the, um, early 2000s, but I didn't go out and actively uh, participate on these these sort of things. So, um, but then I went ahead and went there one day, and I typed in my name, and it like brought up a million and one one images, you know, and and it was like people shared my work pretty uh, extensively, you know, and, and so I, I kind of made some rounds, and I even wound up uh, getting contacted by some galleries later on, or being in shows and having people come up to me and say, "Wow, I remember your work from you know." loving your work from, you know, from like five years ago and I saw it all over Tumblr, but they never credited who you were. I like never knew who you were. Yeah. Well, so, you, you, uh, give your images in high resolution format away on your website, which believe it or not for 2d arts is really rare. People are protective to the point where if you see their work, like at a craft fair or something, and we're talking about like amateur, like painters and artists, like these aren't like, people who went to, to school and learned how to tra paint traditionally or anything, they'll, they don't want you to take photos of their booth. Like sometimes yeah. cause they don't, you know, they don't want you to, to, to steal your work without credit, crediting them, like crop the photo down and post it online and then, and then not get credit for it. But all your, all your work, or at least a large portion of it is all on your website and you can download a high resolution JPEG. So for the social media side, if somebody liked your picture, all they got to do is drag and drop and post it on Reddit and not necessarily include credit information. And it's all over the place and, but which can be good and bad, you know, it's, yeah, it's good if it gives you exposure. It. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad if it gets, uh, names not attached to it. That's no good. On the other hand, like the work is getting seen. What? And if they can figure out who you are, it does raise like your visibility. Like, I guess it would, you know, I could see it affecting like maybe being able to sell prints or something like that. Like if somebody if somebody didn't really see the value in purchasing a print versus just downloading a JPEG and printing it. I think though the audience, you have to keep in mind, for people who do that are not the people who would buy. Yeah, who uh, they, they don't have the financial resources generally. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, well, you, uh, I've I've always like. I've always had a pretty open policy about my images, you know, I mean, uh, I'd have students and people ask me if I was concerned that people could, you know, uh, lift my images off the website and, you know, all of that stuff. And it's, and it's, it's never been anything that's concerned me. In fact, I get people contacting me all the time asking me to provide them images for various projects they're working on. And, you know, I don't give out my print quality ones, you know, that can make like a, a full size poster print, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's like I'm I'm happy that people are interested in in having them, and uh, you know if somebody you know downloads an image of mine and they stick it away in a folder that means something to them and they look at it periodically, and then they're one of those people that that don't know who I am, but then you know one day you know five years from now maybe they stumble across me and they they get to have that moment oh there's that person i always liked i mean even that's good enough for me you know so i'm just happy that that people enjoy the work enough that they that they want to put it out there you know so 
being credited is is ideal, you know. But mm. I would I kind of take either, you know. I'm just happy that the work has its its sort of appeal and its life out there. So, um, so uh, this is being an audio format. We'll have some uh, images on the website and in the print magazine that people can look at. Uh, some of your work is does have nudes in it, and uh, I know that sometimes that's kind of like a shocking subject for people. In and that's something that having grown up in the art world, as far as like in art schools myself, uh, like life drawing is just like just always been a normal thing that people do, and I just understand how it works. And like I remember very clearly in your class, you were like very clinical about the whole thing. Like, it was not in any way, like, you know, something, like, this occurred to me when we were looking up your interviews and stuff yesterday doing research, and uh, Janae found that on Juxtapose, it was categorized as erotica, and I was like, not, yeah. not really. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was the least erotic. I thought if you find some of these images erotic, that they uh, need some kind of help. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I never got that impression at all like in, in in doing life drawing or in taking your class or in any time like that's that's just i mean i guess you could categorize you know like michelangelo's david as as uh erotica you know or that was michelangelo or, <laughs> or like you know like <laughs> classic renaissance artwork as erotica but i don't think that's really a fair description of it <laughs> That seems to be a very no, I mean, American people, attitude towards nudity. Yeah, and well, I mean, I think it's a generational thing. I think it's a educational thing. I mean, people, yeah, have all sorts of uh, different reactions uh, to it, and even my own, you know, has changed quite a bit over over time. I mean, I used to think about it a lot less. I actually think about it more, which you wouldn't think would necessarily be the case, but. Hmm. Um, you know, when I was younger and I took it, I mean, it was just a means to an end. It was about learning and developing a skill set that seemed to, like, set the bar. Like, you uh, you were truly accomplished if you can accomplish this, you know. And uh, figure drawing was sort of that, you know. It's, like, the hardest thing to really master. Oh, yeah. And um, so, to me, it was more this sort of, it's a, it was a drawing challenge. It wasn't <laughs> anything that was sexualized in any way. It was really this um, this test of one's uh, dexterity and, and, and their capabilities. Um, and then, of course, you put it into artwork, and depending on its context and what you do with it, it can be really, er, you know, eroticized. But I, I've never felt that I did that. Um, I, I, I typically uh, utilize the nude because it was sort of timeless. You know, I mean, it, it stands outside the boundaries of being able to be uh, categorized Categorically put into some some niche, some time frame, you know, um, and it just becomes about sort of a natural uh, a beauty, a vulnerability, uh, those sorts of things. Um, especially because of the age model that I age range that I tr typically worked with in my models, it was sort of this this perpetual human, you know, this this specimen of this idyllic specimen of just being a person. Um, but as I've gotten older and, and the models aren't getting older around me necessarily, um, there's a weirder disconnect there. I think I'm a little bit more sensitive about when I want to use nudity and for what end and all sorts of things like that. Um, not that I intentionally ever try to hide nudity, but I have become slightly more conscious of it. Um, and I, it's even something that I'm just sort of processing through because I've, I've started paring down the bodies more and more and dealing more with anatomy and uh, skeletal references and things like that. And every now and then I wonder how much of this body do I still need and want. So, Well, that refers back to something I remember talking about in, in your class. Uh, and, and that's actually the number one fact that stood out in my memory about your work is you were talking about something, uh, how uh, you were trying to figure out the poses in classical uh, painting and whether or not they had used live reference the entire time they were, they were working. And you were, I think there was some series of, of works that you were doing where you had to like pose them in these really awkward positions to try and replicate these classical Renaissance poses. 
Uh, and you were talking, I, I, the, I mean, this is 15 years ago, so I don't re- remember the story exactly, but something about like having to use like, like books and stuff to prop them up into like awkward positions just to get them into those, those Renaissance poses. And I can't remember, uh, like, is this ringing a bell at all or? Well, no, I mean, I remember torturing the living daylights out of models when I was younger. <laughs> I mean, I remember putting them in like these extremely painful poses that I asked them to hold for a very long time. Um, I don't remember necessarily like pursuing any sort of like um, historical reference in that activity, though. I mean, oh. it might have just been this idea of like, you know, how did people manage to work through these, you know? Uh, I mean, because some of those poses can be very, very long, you know, and and uh, and it can be a real challenge for models to hold those things. Um, use- and unless you actually put yourself in that pose, you know, unless you actually hold yourself in that pose, you don't even realize exactly how bad it's going to be. Well, do you ever use photography for uh, in instances like that? Take a photograph and then draw from the photograph? Uh, when I started, I switched to using a variety of different things when I moved to Eastern, uh, when I moved to Michigan. Because when I first moved to Michigan, I had a really hard time finding models and the people that they utilized at the university were not people that I was wanting to work with. Um, so I had to stay in contact with a lot of the people that I still work knew and, and could work with back in Illinois. And, um, I started a whole series of paintings, um, that was actually my first step into using anatomical references. Um, and it made sense because then I could just kind of lock them into a pose and then I digitally kind of broke down their bodies and created the anatomy and then I had this constant reference point to draw from. Uh, because when you're drawing from a model, there's always shifts and movements in your... So things aren't as... Uh, you can't fixate, I guess, as much on things outside of the body when you're drawing the figure. Like you're so preoccupied with with getting it right, that sitting there and thinking about how you're going to break down anatomical things while you're drawing them seems like a real juggling act to me. So um, anyway, so I wound up going back and actually getting several of them to agree to photo reference for me. And ever since I started doing that, um, I typically have drawing sessions that are often complemented by some sort of long-term photo reference that I can go back to. So um, I utilize uh, both uh, pretty regularly nowadays. I read on your website or on an interview that you ask questions to your models when you draw them. It had mentioned from uh, what their favorite color is to what they think their cause of death will be. Uh, where did you come up with these questions and what are the other ones? I'm very curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, that series, and that was the one that I was mentioning, that was the first series I did after I um, came to Easter in that anatomy series. And it it was really stemming from my interest in uh, anatomy at that time, and it had to do with um, an illness in my family and kind of how medical images started just becoming a lot. I looked at a lot more of them at that time to try to understand and process um, what was happening to them and what could be done for them. And I became preoccupied with these images, and that's why I think I've continued to reference anatomy um, to this day. And at that time, I was really interested in in how the images function because they were this anonymous sort of, like I had always drawn figures, but they were always sort of um, people, you know, they were, uh, they were individuals in a way. And all of a sudden, I was looking at these cross sections of bodies that were anything but individuals. I mean, they were designed uh, quite specifically to deny uh, the sense of an individual um, within the within their context or pages. Um, so when I started drawing those models, um, I was working with two image types. If you look at those paintings in the background, you'll see a lot of cartoon characters actually within that color field. So I was looking at this sort of cartoon body, right, and uh, and how, like, they represented the visual book- bookends of a person, right? Like, our first concepts of bodies really came from the cartoons that we watched, you know? And they're sort of elastic and boundless, and they can... Uh, they kind of become infinite, right? They they don't perish, right? Um, and then on the other end of that spectrum, uh, towards the later part of our lives, you know, we become more preoccupied with these these medical texts and medical images as as we sort of uh, encounter the other side of that, which is a body that's really quite uh, finite, right? Um, so I was 
kind of interested in bringing those two images together um, against this idea of an individual. So I would ask them, the first thing I'd ask them when they came in was I'd ask them what their favorite color was, um, and that became the color field. And then I'd ask them what their favorite childhood picture book was. Um, what their fa favorite childhood um, cartoon was, um, and those became the line drawings that populate the background. And then I'd ask them uh, what they thought they might die of and how old they thought they'd be when they died. So, and you're talking about people that are in their 20s, right? Mm -hmm. So they're kind of, um, they're, they're pretty far removed from that elastic infinite body, right? They're, they're yeah. starting to become more aware of themselves as people. Uh, but at the same time, they're still very far removed, typically, uh, from the idea of their own mortality, right? So th they became interesting subjects of these sort of people between these two extreme ideas of like the infinite and the, the finite body. So, you know, they would say things that were probably historically um, within their family, like uh, Jessica said, um, ovarian cancer. So then um, I opened up her body to expose her uterus and ovaries. Um, you know, so it was all, uh, I think her background was like you know, animaniacs and the, something like the magic tadpole or something. I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd sometimes sell me their books, and I'd be like, I have no idea what picture that book that is, you know, because they were already generationally mm -hmm. removed enough from me that I didn't even recognize their picture books. But yeah, that was always a weird thing, and I made this vow that every time I hired a new model, the first thing I would do is stand them against a wall and ask them those five questions and make a whole series of paintings out of it. But like all good ideas, right, over time, you know, you want to move on, your ideas change, and you start seeing how your initial approach to those ideas were kind of limited by that format, and then I wanted to open them up into new new ways of exploring or thinking. So the series never made it past like maybe five or six models. But I mean, it, as I said, it did serve as sort of a launching point to a lot of the same ideas that I still work with today. It's interesting. It's like the kind of the cartoons are like their mythology that they want to live up to almost. Yeah, well, in a way, I mean, it's sort yeah. of uh, like you kind this of this idea of well, it's just our concepts of self. I mean, when we're when we're that young, or you know, and, and uh, I mean, we can fall, you know we can watch cartoon characters fall off of a cliff and sort of just you know have mm -hmm. stars sort of circle their head and then they just get up and walk away. And I don't think children think about how the activities they're engaging in could kill them. You know, no, like the know. concept of of being killed or or being uh, uh, damaged in some way it just sort of isn't part of the language at that level, I don't think. You know, they're, they're surrounded by these representations of themselves that are fantastic, you know. And, and it's not to say anatomy isn't fantastic. I would say it's actually more fantastic because it's, uh, it's grounded in a reality that's, you know, incredibly complex. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's all about uh, sort of its, its failings, its limits, you know. So, uh, you, you know, you're not going to see a, an anatomy study that suggests you're going to, you know, survive a fall off of a cliff. But so we were talking about uh, using live models and uh, doing life drawing, and that was something that, like, I never, you know, I probably never come anywhere close to uh, mastering drawing, but it's something I still do and uh, something I've always cared about. And that was actually with life drawing for me. I thought of it as a as a technical challenge. It was like at the time that I was learning to draw, I very quickly found out that it was relatively easy to draw a building or a tree or a car or, you know, something static, but like living creatures are, are particularly difficult to render, uh, like anatomically and accurately. And even going back to like high school art classes, I was drawing like anatomical, like skeletons of horses and stuff like that. Like those were always like, it always just seemed like, well, if I can do this, like I can draw whatever I want. If I can draw a person that looks like a person or like hands and, the uh, from doing life drawing classes, uh, that it was almost impossible to develop that skill to a professional level without doing life drawing, like without doing like hand studies, mm -hmm. without, without actually sitting there and like drawing actual people, but actually like training yourself, uh, to, to draw what you're seeing instead of drawing that cartoon character 
version of what people look like, which I think is how a lot of people, uh -huh. their art starts in childhood <laughs> yeah. and they watch cartoons and they draw these cartooned, you know, like they draw a nose as like a circle in the middle of the face. And like a nose doesn't look like that at all. <laughs> and a nose isn't mm -hmm. a nose shaped shape in the middle of the face. Like there's all these planes and there's light hitting it. And the process of learning how to draw and render like a, a body is like a really like, you almost have to like stop seeing what you're seeing and just see like the various pieces of like how the light's hitting this part or, you know, how, you know, uh, like I've heard a lot of people like taking a photograph, turning it upside down. So you're not seeing the face the same way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so for anybody who's not familiar with, with any of this, like formal art training stuff, cause not every, I mean, they've taken it out of schools. Like, uh, you know, they don't have, in a lot of places, they don't have the kind of arts programs that people my age or older had when they were in school, even in high school level. And our 2D art has been so de-emphasized that there's there's kind of like a loss of of that whole knowledge. And it's really hard to explain to someone who's never had any formal art training at all. And you still have art, you still have art galleries, you still have, uh, you know, 22 year olds who want to be painters. But it seems like a lot of it is happening outside of, of any kind of formal training. And, uh, I feel like a lot of it's been, I mean, I don't want to get too opinionated about, but the whole postmodernist like contemporary art movement, like doesn't have the technical training that, previous generations of artists had and uh that was something i what was already kind of happening at the point when i was in art school uh i was already seeing that and going oh you know i don't like that and i like that about your work was that you were doing it was kind of it wasn't uh neoclassical recycling of renaissance realism but it did have realistic elements in it and and when you're drawing from life when you're drawing human form that is something you can't do with a photograph that in order to to in order to produce an image like one of your images in your in your drawings you you would you could do it with photoshop but you'd have to be able to draw just as well in photoshop to be able to produce that same image like there's no way there's no artificial means to fake that you know, like it's, it may be hard to communicate over the internet. It may be hard to, 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 uh, to technically do. So it's not a mass skill that lots of people have, but it is like, you don't see that a lot. You're one of the very, very few artists. I mean, Alex Gray is one of the only ones that comes to mind that does the same, that does human bodies and stuff like that has like some of the anatomical elements and stuff like that. Like, you don't see a lot of artists who do that anymore. Like most of it's, uh, I, I mean, my joke is always like you go to an art museum and there's like a mattress with a bunch of tampons stapled to it. And then like a five paragraph essay on the little plate next to it on the wall that explaining the, the postmodernist manifesto that goes with this, this piece. And I feel like we're losing something there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at, uh, like, the body in art, like a contemporary survey of figurative art, you do see that sort of trajectory, you know, of um, highly representational sort of figural work that then sort of moves into more conceptually driven um, approaches to the body that doesn't even necessarily have a representation of a body attached to it. It's more like a, um, a side reference to the body, you know, like um, it, its absence becomes the content. I guess on some ways, or the suggestion of its its former presence is maybe a better way of saying it than its absence. But um, I get what you're saying, and and I would say even in the school I work at, you know, um, in the time I've been here, we've seen a shift in uh, you know the pedagogical approach to like how you put together a foundations program and what types of courses are essential to student needs. And you know, um, we used to have uh, life drawing as a required foundations course, and it has now been moved into sort of an elective. Um, it's required within painting and drawing and some traditional 2D uh, media courses, um, but then there's a whole swath of them that don't require it. Uh, so students would only take it if they opted to. Um, and I think, you know, because there's this big push towards new media, 
um, time-based media, uh, things like that, um, you know, they question, you know, whether these students are going to actually um, get anything uh, from from the process of drawing a figure. Um, I've always argued that it's a very different type of drawing, um, which is why I think it's it's an essential thing. Yeah, but in live drawing, you know, I mean, uh, it's the only place that you're teaching dynamic drawing, you know. You, you, you can explain dynamic concepts, I guess, to people in a foundations class, class looking at, um, you know, a pile of still life objects. Uh, but, you know, they're static, they're fixed, they're measurable, you know, there's no sense of consequence entwined in them. Uh, where when you're drawing a figure, it's all about consequence, you know. It's all about the balancing, the, the tension of weight, you know, the passive and active relationships of the body. You know, so it's this, uh, it's a much more complex way of thinking about drawing and what you're even trying to capture within the drawing, you know, because uh, a good figure drawing isn't just going to be a matter of capturing edges and, you know, uh, simple proportions of width to height, you know. It's about capturing that sense of twist and turn and um, thrust and energy and mass, you know, just... There's so many more ideas that you're talking about in the language of drawing and how you can try to capture those through your tools and through that mark making. Um, so it's a much richer thing, and it's it's really, um, to me, a much more exciting way to draw, you know. Um, so, yeah. It's it's uh it's one of those things where I, I, I think everyone, you know, should give it a try, <laughs> you know. Uh it's interesting because, you know, as I was saying before, you know, bodies are everywhere. Bodies are sort of central to 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 how we define ourselves and how we see the world and how we navigate things. Everything's sort of designed with bodies in mind. Um so it's it's still a really um engaging complex, interesting exercise to try to draw a figure from life. And if you don't know how to kind of navigate those concepts and you are just working from photographs, then your images are always going to feel sort of stifled by that. You're not going to be able to kind of infuse them with that understanding of dynamics that you would if you were actually looking at them um, in a space and working with the model. Um, plus, there's just something different about actually having someone there that you kind of talk to and are engaged with on, on different levels, um, you know, because people can do things where, you know, they just lift the, a photo. I mean, I've seen a lot of digital artwork where it's like, you know, the photo is just sort of um, almost woven into the fabric of the digital work itself, and eventually they build up um, different layers and masks over it to kind of um, bring it more completely into the <laughs> its illustrative or illustrative context, you know, like they make it look seamless like it's not a photo, but really it's just sort of there and it's been traced and built upon to the point where, you know, having any knowledge of the figure is not necessarily required. But then, you know, that's when you see sort of these weird telltales, you know, when, when things just anatomically seem a little skewed because they didn't understand how a plane on the volume really moved. And that's the difference between having someone sitting in front of you versus looking at some sort of washed-out reference or something like that. But, you know, a lot of kids learn from those online sites that have figures, you know, that they can look at, and they have, like, a series of 12 photos that rotate it, so they can at least kind of think about how volumes are foreshortening and working. So there's things out there that can, you know, help people and, and supplement learning, you know, if they don't have access to a life drawing class and they want to learn how to draw a figure. I mean, there's there's things out there that can help them, but, yeah, nothing will substitute actually being in a space working with a person, you know. It's just completely different. I think that what you're saying is that fundamentals are crucial to education. My background is actually in music education, and then I have my master's in electronic music and computer music. Um, I do think that a similar idea is missing in the world of music, that people don't see the value in learning how to play the piano. I mean, traditionally, all music students must learn how to play basic piano in order to understand basic music theory to understand how music is put together, and you build from that foundation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So going to education, I've seen that STEM is now STEAM and that they're adding the arts into what they consider um, like crucial for education. And I would like to just talk about why the arts are important for everyone and why they are a crucial part of education and if you feel that they are. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> our, our art educator, uh, she always talks about, you know, how they're pushing for steam in Michigan. Um, I mean, the arts are, uh, 
you know, they're, they're where problem solving happens, you know, there's a layer of invention uh, within the arts that, that just don't exist in other disciplines, or at least in the same way. And, you know, for the longest time, there was like the MFA is the new MBA, you know, sort of thing, uh, where people with fine arts degrees and advanced art degrees, you know, they were going to bring a, a way of looking and thinking and conceptualizing through problems uh, that would yield, you know, um, more compelling or uh, variable sort of solutions, you know, to problems like, oh, they, you know, they're going to come with this whole uh, creative background um, to make them better make them better, I guess, at looking at a very familiar set of criteria or factors in, in some new way, right? Because, I mean, what artists are constantly doing are kind of taking what you were saying, like fundamentals, um, but learning how to make additions to those, right? How to then expand upon that language or that knowledge to invent new language and new knowledge, right? So, you know, teaching someone skills and and then allowing them opportunities to negotiate and problem solve and to think about, you know, how, I mean, because part of making art isn't just um, a facility, you know, um, part of it is like the, how am I understanding my problem? How am I expressing my ideas? How am I giving them visual shape or visual form or how, how might one compose um, a piece of music? Um, it's all the same sort of thing. And when I taught at Interlock and Arts Academy, I mean, I remember dealing with these young art kids and they were always sort of overwhelmed and, and a little bit frustrated because, you know, it was predominantly a music academy. So they put on these big concerts and you'd have these kids come out and there'd be like ensembles of like, you know, 20 or 30 kids and they'd be playing this amazing stuff. And you'd be like, wow, I can't believe what those, you know, 14 year olds, uh, 13 year olds are pulling off. It's, it's just amazing. Um, and then you'd have the, the, the visual arts kids sort of feeling down on themselves like you know they were somehow the lesser of the uh, of the art kids or something and it'd be like well you know you know you got to put it in context you know <laughs> it's like if all i had you do was learn how to draw this one perfect bottle and every day you came here and i talked to you more and more about drawing that perfect bottle and then i put you in a practice hut where all you did was draw that bottle <laughs> and and you were only responsible for drawing one twentieth of the bottle, and there would be other nineteen other kids that helped you draw that bottle. You know, by the time, you know, three weeks later, you would go out and you would just draw that little piece of the bottle on demand. I was like, you know, you're kind of here in isolation, and you're working through this problem, and you're, you know, developing these skills. And it's not to say the music kids weren't either, but I was trying to point out, you know, like they learn their scales, you know, they learn their, their chord progressions. And, you know, with the visual arts student, they're learning how to work with line and how to work with value and how to work with textures and how to translate forms and perspective on all of those things. And it's, you know, once that language gets built, then obviously they have um, the, the tools to be more, more creative. Um, but I, I might have died, I might have just delved off into some sort of random well, tangent there, actually, apart from what you were asking. But <laughs> that's actually uh, very much like this is dovetailing completely with what I was ranting about in the car last night, which is that the value. Like I didn't have I played piano as a kid, but I didn't continue my my formal music education past I think junior high. Uh, but I was always steeped in the arts. You know, my my family has a bunch of arts educators in it uh and it's always just been all around me and like i you know before i went off on my own career tangent that was like i mean when i was 18 years old i wanted to be an artist i wanted to be a visual artist and i got into graphic design and then drifted into uh marketing and communications and pr from there and like it, it's but originally my the original thread that led down that rabbit hole was visual arts and something that I've been saying since the very early, you know, I, I don't even know when I became conscious of this, but that uh, at least with, with visual arts, it teaches you nonlinear problem solving that so much of our education system and anybody here who's got a kid in school or anybody who's listening who's got a kid, kid in school knows, you know, they teach the test, they teach you a list of facts that, that every question has an answer. There's a, there's a solution to every problem, and that solution has already been worked out. What do we do with styrofoam cups? We put it in this type of recycling container. What, how, do, how do we do this task? We do A, B, C, and D. How do we do this task? We do A, B, C, and D. And in my professional life, 
in offices that I've worked in, even though I was not working in the arts, people would be astounded by things I would come up with because they would just be like, oh, we could do this instead. And and they would be like, how did you, how did you think of that? And it's like, well, uh, you know, like they're, they're like, here, write a series of steps to explain how you do that. How do you do that? And it's like, I do, there's not, it's not a step-by-step process. And they're like, no, no, you've got step, write them down. And like every single time I sit down on the computer to do something, I'm not doing a step. I'm not checking things off a checklist. Like I'm like, I got an idea. I'm going to go bam, 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 bam. And I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And they seem totally unrelated. And like, if somebody's watching me, it just seems like I'm doing random things. But like for a visual artist, that's just like, you know, you, you just learn to think like that where you, you know, uh, there, there isn't a solution. Maybe there's some guidelines. Maybe the paper has to be 36 by 24 inches and you have to use charcoal and, uh, it's due on the 14th and, uh, it's got it's to it's it's <laughs> be, it's got to be include yeah. this, this, and this element. And other than that, now that's your assignment. Now you go. And then other than that, you have to fill in everything about that solution. And most of the world is, is pretty much run on procedure. And like I had, you know, I worked an office job years ago where, where they literally were tearing their hair out, trying to get me to write procedures for what I did. Like when I was designing a logo, and like, yeah. I'm like I can't write you a procedure for that. It's not possible. You have no. to learn how. The only way for you to to do what I do with this software is for you to go to art school or for you to study these these concepts yourself and learn how to think this way. I think they need to be teaching those <laughs> concepts to kids. For I mean, not necessarily. Like I was a piano teacher. I didn't expect every my piano students to be a concert pianist, but they are learning those type of thinking skills by learning how to like. I always like to interpret, uh, include composition in teaching, just in order to teach uh, how to think creatively and outside the box. Yeah, well, and music, music gets shoved. I believe and, writing too. They need to be teaching that in school, writing from a creative standpoint, and not just. Uh, expository writing. Yeah. And, and a, yeah lot I mean, of- a lot of it is like how to apply that knowledge, you know, like critical thinking and then how to, uh, how to um, apply it on some levels outside of a um, prescribed context. I mean, cause you're, you're given a sense of like how uh, this is how to put it in music. Cause I think people sometimes understand music easier than visual arts. As you were saying, most people don't maybe have a background to understand how, how 2d work even comes to existence. It just sort of manifests itself and it's there, this finished piece. But, um, but in music, it's easier to understand that you're teaching someone how to play a scale. Um, but then at some point you, they have to learn how to improvise within that scale, you know, and then they learn to create within that scale and then they can, you know, progress into more and more complex solutions where they work and, you know, um, challenge maybe how even the skills work and work in discordant ways. Unfortunately, all of that, that, uh, mode sort of, of teaching has kind of gone away. Uh, a lot of music supposedly education now is they teach a kid a song and cause they want to learn songs. Cause that's fun. And then appreciation for fundamentals is definitely, uh, not as strong as it once was. Because people don't see how learning these skills teaches someone how to think critically. They don't see the relationship between how that develops in other areas of life. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I was saying, even with my own colleagues at the university level where you think we'd be slightly more enlightened, <laughs> you know, there's this tendency to say, oh, maybe we don't need life drawing and foundations, you know, uh, because they don't understand the, the, the way the dynamic drawing and the way that you work through dynamic problems, um, like it introduces a new level of problem solving and thinking and visualizing that allows people to push um, the space and the, the, the language of their drawings in much different ways than you could ever teach them in any different uh, sort of context, you know. Um, so yeah, I think we all, you know, it's easy to think you know, I think it's easy to kind of lose track of, yeah, how important those those fundamentals are. But I think ultimately what you were talking about, that idea of um, critical response, having some ability to assess and, and critically engage the choices you're making um, is part of what an arts background gives you you, which is why, you know, that idea of why it's valuable within the STEAM uh, sort of system, you know, um, 
because every day I teach, you know, I even here when I go to um, meetings on campus and I'm, I'm talking to faculty in other departments and they kind of don't understand how a studio class is taught, you know, and it's like, it really is different. Every, it isn't like I teach something and then the next semester I go in and I give the same lecture, you know, because I'm dealing with uh, 15 to 20 different people with different ways of thinking, uh, with different ideas, with different skills, skill sets. And, you know, so there's this, the, the conversations we have are constantly changing, especially once you get into an intermediate or advanced level course. You know, you are just, um, you're constantly engaged in new ways of trying to understand, um, you know, what your objectives are, what your goals are, what, how you can go about trying to achieve them. Um, so you're, you're constantly in a, a new sort of mode of negotiation every day. And I think that's when you develop the critical skills and ultimately the language to, yeah, um, to work through problems in a more um, intuitive but also critical way, you know, like a thoughtful way. Um, so you've, you've said a couple of key words in that last little, little part where you, you mentioned intuition and you uh, mentioned the relationships between things. I think that's uh, perhaps another way we can kind of tie this back. Conscious Community Magazine, which uh, underwrites this podcast, this is a production that we put out under their auspices, and uh, it's published on their website and through their social media and whatnot. And they're a largely a metaphysical, uh, they're the oldest uh, metaphysical magazine in the country, um, and it's a lot of subjects that you see a lot uh, that are very popular these days. You see uh, yoga and meditation and there's nutrition stuff as far as like uh, uh, organic foods and, and you know green living kind of kind of themes. In the past, we've had quite a bit on, on writing, on metaphysical writing, and on uh, people who talk about like more therapeutic mod- modalities, just as far as like addiction recovery and stuff like that. I think that where the arts relates to all that, and and that I think that. Uh, art re- is very relevant and me and Janae had discussed this and she wasn't exactly sure why I wanted to have the arts and music like how does that like relate to specifically this like are we just using this platform as an excuse for me to shoehorn stuff that I'm into onto a podcast uh, I think that it very much is relevant because well, I definitely think it's relevant the, I think there is a, a overlap between the type of intuitive person who uh, thinks about things like spirituality, who thinks about like like these these greater overarching abstract concepts, and the artist that the artist, the visual artists especially, uh, uh, although I would say songwriters would probably fall in this this category too. Uh, not so much uh, instrumentalists, but visual artists. Uh, they play with the interplay of abstract concepts in their trade. Like that is like you, you know, other than the technical skill of drawing a human body in space, like all those questions you're asking your subject and how you're building that into like a, what that painting or what that drawing means or using a model, you know, of the shipwreck of the Medusa or whatever, you know, where you're, where you're, you're telling a, a story and this has, you know, allegorical symbolism or mythological significance. Like there's, there's huge overlaps in the art world and art has had religious connections for as long as it's been. <laughs> so where does Mike Reedy's drawings, like how does that apply to, uh, you know, spirituality? Well, it's all the same stuff. You're still like, like pawing over these greater uh, symbolic, you know, metaphysical concepts, met- meta cognitive concepts about self and identity and, uh, you know, mortality and death and rebirth and all these, all these things are all going on in that artistic dialogue. And at very much that's belongs right in the same wheelhouse. Like as far as I'm concerned, like you, you, your art, like, you know, you look at the greatest artists in history, like the greatest artist in history wasn't the guy who did the same, you said mentioned the same base, like who was, wasn't the guy who did the same angel statue 500 times. It was the guy who did, you know, the one that everybody knows, the Sistine Chapel. And you look up and there's all this 
challenging emotional drama going on in the artwork like it doesn't let it's not it's not to make you comfortable like it's not you know it's 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 not something that's like oh that's nice or oh that's pretty like it's challenging you and making you think about things and uh the artist definitely puts that into it and every person who looks at it puts their own things into it and it's all part of the same I, I mean, honestly, metaphysical is the best word I can come up It's all part of the same meta- metaphysical s- sphere. Like, there's the, the very concrete, objective reality of tables and desks and, you know, cups of coffee. And then there's, you know, all these abstract concepts. And that's that's the universe that the, that the visual artist lives in. You know, that they're always mm-hmm. thinking about that interplay. And, to, you know, even if they're not working, they're still thinking that way. Yeah, well, it depends on what visual artist you're talking about. <laughs> you know, because, because as you were saying, there's some, you know, I mean, I, I don't know that I, I would wrap us all, all of us up so tightly in that bundle. I mean, I can definitely see myself there. I mean, a lot of my work, especially as of late, you know, comes from, you know, a place where I'm trying to work through, you know, a lot of feelings and issues of, of just growing older, you know, of never having children, of all of these sort of things about, you know, what, is meaningful to me, what's beautiful to me, trying to find um, beauty in things that are tragic, you know, because I've kind of turned that corner where I have a lot more tragedy ahead of me than not. (laughs) And, um, you know, in terms of aging parents and um, ailing family members and, um, and all of that, but, but trying to find, you know, the, the beauty in that and how to persevere through that and all of, all of these things I think are part of, the the ideas that I'm working through. But, you know, obviously I have colleagues, you know, where if you ask them what they're interested in, they're just interested in color and the interaction of color as a visual phenomenon, you know. So mm-hmm. do I think that, you know, they're they're working through some sort of larger, uh, they're, they're almost, you know, um, I don't know what I'd, I'd say. They're like, you know, visual uh, engineers in a way. You know, they're, thinking, they're working yeah, through, a very engineering <laughs> they're working through different types of, yeah, different types of, of problems. But then there are a lot of people that are, you know, using their, their craft as a means to kind of, um, you know, think about, you know, those larger questions, you know, that you mentioned, you know, the, the ones that have sort of uh, populated art for a long time. So, and that, that ties into another uh, topic that I, uh, when we were ta- discussing this interview that we, we talked about, which is... Uh, I personally have had experiences. I've worked in, in the music field. I've worked uh, like somewhat professionally. I guess nobody really makes money in that anymore, so anybody can call themselves a professional. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, worked, I've worked in the music field, and uh, I, I personally found that, that uh, this was in you know, the, uh, the world of electronic music, and I firstly found it is a magnet for very, very deeply damaged people. And we've talked about this subject with several of our guests and discussed like what is it about uh, what is it about creative creative processes that attracts damaged people uh, that that or does it, it make us damaged? Maybe it makes <laughs> us damaged. <laughs> that that it seems uh, like a lot of times you have people who who they came from a bad home growing up or they had some kind of you know traumatic tra- experience. And that they they want to express it, and they turn to painting and drawing or photography or or music. And several of our guests have said, "Well, everybody's damaged, so anybody in the arts is going to be damaged." But uh, we did want to we did want to touch on that with you and, and see just how you felt about the art as as both something that attracts people who are in need of healing, and also as a means to to help that healing. Yeah, I've seen a lot of books um, like. Drawing a spiritual practice, uh, drawing on the right side of the brain, all these sorts of things, and this kind of using art as art therapy, art healing, music therapy, music healing. It's um, a really large field right now. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have, uh, you know, I've encountered a lot of a lot of students over the years. I mean, I've been, um, you know, teaching for like 19 years now. It's hard to believe, but... And yeah, I've met some some of the students actually that I would say uh, make the most compelling work. Um, normally, are coming from places that are more personal, um, slightly painful at times, maybe, and they seem to be 
you know, just the, I think because they were, I, I would say that, you know, art for me, right? Like I didn't have a bad, bad childhood. I didn't have any of that. I mean, the only things I remember from childhood are trauma, but they were, they were external traumas, you know, just getting hurt for one reason or another. But um, what happened to me is I moved around a lot. You know, when I was growing up, we didn't stay in a place more than four or five years. So um, I didn't have, uh, drawing was an outlet for me, one that my parents supported, even though no one in my family has an art art background, um, that uh, it gave me a place to focus and to make things and to, I don't know, it was almost like a, a diary, but I wasn't sophisticated enough to, um, to to write my thoughts maybe, but I drew a lot. And I think that when you're introverted and you're constantly sort of um, isolated either intentionally or just by circumstance like I was, um, that creative fields like writing and, and music and art, um, you know, it gives you an outlet to um, to put put your words out or your ideas or your feelings out so that they're, they're real outside of yourself. You know, when you have good friends, you can talk through your thoughts and your feelings. And, um, when you're isolated, you know, you, you don't, you don't have those sort of outlets, then it's easy to imagine how, uh, the arts could really replace that or supplement that in some way. Um, but I do think that, uh, the people that come in with, um, sort of this much more acute awareness of themselves tend to do a lot better in terms of making work. You know, they, they tend to be a lot more sensitive and a lot more thoughtful about uh, what they're wanting. And, um, you know, they've just developed, I guess, a, you know, almost like Cy Twombly or something, you know, where their, their mark making and their symbology and stuff like that has become complex enough and that it actually feels significant versus just... Um, self-indulgent or opaque, you know, I mean, sometimes people come in and try really hard to be emotional and it just comes off as, you know, sort of staged and, and opaque and it doesn't have any sort of depth to it. And then there's other people that are, um, you know, that have a real, uh, a real raw sort of, um, accessible quality that their artwork, you know, sort of is like this, uh, this window for them, uh, to not only have people see them, but to actually see out, I think, you know, um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I just rambled again. I'm realizing that I'm in a real <laughs> oh, no, ramble from, from your question. But I mean, I think, I guess I see where you're coming from. I think that the arts provides people voices, you know, and I think if you're someone who um, maybe is struggling, uh, you know, that you don't have a voice for some reason, whether it be, as I said, for any number of reasons, like moving around a lot or, or having maybe a potentially abusive um, home or who knows what, um, that, that it's a place for you to to find that voice and and I wouldn't say that uh, that it's uncommon to meet people that come in that are highly emotive you know within the arts and definitely have a background that seems like it's um, sort of loaded with a lot of things potentially uh, but at the same time I have some really nice uh, straight laced kids that come in that seem like you know <laughs> they they they, uh, they have a really happy life but then they you know not to be cynical but you know they they don't tend to make the most interesting things sometimes uh, you know they go and they uh, they pursue pursue more applied arts you know they make jewelry or something maybe <laughs> not to throw my jewelry colleagues under the bus there <laughs> like a, a craft or something but um you know, they, they maybe go into things that don't, um, they just are more about aesthetics, you know, or design or something like that where they don't have to have them themselves uh, sort of sort of put within it. I think people that go into painting and stuff are romantics, you know, for the most part, you know, they're sort of self-indulgent romantic types. Um, well, I that's one thing is that I think that those those people who are the most expressive, who do, do work in, in any artistic medium, including music uh, and, and art, uh, that tend to be the most expressive and maybe the most vulnerable. Like they're also uh, like vulnerable to predation. That uh, you have, uh, you know, if and this is something that I encountered in the, in the music industry, and it just like it's it's a a drum I like to bang about, but, uh, uh, it's, you know, the music industry is a industry in a way that the art scene isn't as much of an industry. Like it's, and there is, 
an art, a visual art, you know, people sell paintings and stuff like that, but it's not a multi-billion dollar media empire the way the music business is. And the music mm-hmm. business is uh, largely not run by people who are the most amazing musicians themselves. And uh, in my experience, that a lot of them are really aggressive and really, really predatory and, and the, the, the young musicians who are coming into it and, you know, maybe they, maybe they just were shy and introverted and focused on playing music and maybe they had childhood trauma and, and express themselves through music, but they are uh, kind of lambs to the slaughter against the uh, machinery of the industry. And um, I think that that is, uh, that's kind of, I've seen it justified in that industry as, uh, well, uh, they're damaged people, so it's okay to damage them, basically. And I think that's really a really horrible, horrible attitude. And that's, that's something that's absolutely got to stop at some point. That's, I think though, sorry to interrupt you, but going back to that, I think people have this kind of delusion that only damaged people and the more damaged they are, the better their art is. Yeah. And that's, that's like Basquiat is great because he was so messed up kind of idea versus looking at it. Yeah, like well, maybe what could have a person made if they were they have, if they can function better they could actually be more prolific. Well, you 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 have this bizarre phenomena in the music industry, and this is just something I've just gotten a sense of. You know that that you have when they see somebody who's really talented, they know they can make a lot of money on him, so they kind of isolate him and harass him and annoy him and and keep him tortured so he can produce. You know, like, like, because, you know, the more tortured, the more starving the artist, the better the art. And it's, it's like, I absolutely don't think that that had, like, I think you can take somebody out of a horrible childhood or out of an introverted childhood and nurture them and have them produce great art. I don't think you need to keep making their life miserable so that they'll keep being good at it. Like, you know, like that is just a very like Neanderthal, like, like approach I to like a producing approach. a marketable product. You know, I think, and that's, I think that's just really heinous. That people <laughs> like their Kurt Cobain. They like the person that's suffering. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like a sacrifice. Like a re- almost, you know, like he's suffering for us. You think of that? Yeah. With, uh, with, with visual artists, you know, it's like, it's actually a lot, it's different. It's tougher actually in a lot of ways. And, and I think that's sadly where the people that sort of have this um, this sort of um, wonderful well of things that they draw from that make their work seem highly personable, uh, personal, but um, accessible and compelling. You know that you can tell there's some sort of uh, authenticity is such a horrible word to throw around, but you can tell there's a voice within the work that's um, that's not being um, manufactured, right? That isn't um, just just following some sort of framework to 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 be compelling in a certain sort of way, you know that it it seems to spring from them naturally, and they're producing this work. Most of the same people that make that work, though, um, seem to suffer from a crippling sense of self doubt. Right? Mm-hmm. Like they make great work, but they're actually also very um, insecure about their work on on certain levels. And it's about getting them to get past that, to have the skills to go out and approach a gallery, right, to try to get shows, to get representation, you know, to to find that value in their work really requires them to sort of um, transcend that victim sort of or or that sort of um, introverted person that they are. I mean, because you got to think when they're going out, some of these people won't even become teachers, you know. And I remember when I applied uh, to teach at NIU as a grad student, um, I went in and did my interview, and uh, they asked me some questions, and I answered them all. And then I remember the woman, one of the women who was interviewing me, Dorothea, she turned uh, to a colleague and said, I don't know, he's awfully quiet. And I remember just screaming, I, I can project my voice <laughs> really well, because I thought they were criticizing me for for just not talking loud enough. And what they were really criticizing was the fact that I was shy. Like, in their minds, they didn't think I would have a voice or an authority uh, to present within a classroom to make it successful, you know. And so a lot of these, uh, you know, students, um, they sort of have this really... Um, 
wonderful personal thoughtfulness to what they're doing, but then they're also sort of slightly crippled by their own insecurities about things. But that actually makes them more thoughtful, which makes their work even better. But then it's like trying to, you know, provide them with the the skills of the confidence because this this uh, um, profession really requires you to to be a full time marketer for yourself. I mean, you got to figure out how to get your work out. You got to write show proposals. You got to go after galleries. You got to like try to generate contacts, and all of that isn't going to work for a wallflower. You know, I mean, you're just if you don't make efforts to get your work out, no one's going to do it for you. You know, so you have to kind of. Uh, get to a point where people start to notice you. And then and then it gets a little easier because, as I said, like with me, I was saying recently that I've been getting more invites than I've been trying to find things. And at some point, you know, hopefully you do turn that corner where things start to become uh, easier and it's not on you. But a lot of it is, you know. It's, uh, the arts is that way. I mean, in general, I think there's this sense that, uh, you know, people are always like, well, what are you going to do with that? You know, what, what kind of career are you going to have with that degree or what are you going to do with your artwork? Um, and it's really up to you to kind of step forward and prove that there's value in it and to make things happen for yourself. And that can be really hard for people sometimes. Uh, Very talented people. So, Yeah, I absolutely agree. That is the, you, you, you do have to dig deep and you have to find it in yourself and you have to you know, gain a sense. I mean, I'm... Uh, I'm, I talk all the time and I'm very like extroverted appearing, but I really am an introvert. Like that's, I think there's a, a lot, like I was very, 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 very cripplingly shy up until I was probably 19 or 20 years old that I, you know, and, uh, I, everybody tells me I talk too much now, but it's like, I don't think you understand. I've got a lot to say. I didn't say anything until I was like 19 or 20 years old. Like I just didn't talk. <laughs> And it just all yeah. kind of has been pouring out of me ever since. But like, I really, I'm a very introverted person. I had to learn how to go out there and aggressively pursue my own, uh, protect my own interests. But I think that there's, you know, as a society uh, in the whole, we benefit from artists making it through that. Like whether it's artists or musicians or any, any of those creative thinkers, any of those problem solvers, any of those, uh, critical thinkers that, that by having a system that is just sink or swim and you just throw them off the end of the dock when they're 18 years old and hope they survive running off to Hollywood with an acoustic guitar on their back is just insanity because what you end up with is a huge casualty rate, um, for some of our most valuable minds that if you can get them through to 25 or 26 and a master's degree are, and maybe their, maybe their undergraduate was in, was in painting, but their master's degree, they went and got an MBA and they're it's totally unrelated to a career in the arts. They don't use art. They don't use music on a daily basis, but having gone through that process, being a shy, introverted, thoughtful teenager, getting out into college and wanting to be an artist and then maybe getting more serious into, into something that's, less romantic. I mean, that's my, my arc was that I ended up with an administration degree. Like it has nothing to do whatsoever with art. And I think one of the reasons why I'm good at what I do in the things that I do is that I have that creative background and Mm -hmm. it was a miracle for me to have survived that. It was a miracle. And I didn't come from a hugely impoverished fan background or any from any kind of like, we moved around a lot too. I had my knocks when I was a kid, but like nothing compared to how most people have to, you know, the vast majority of people are growing up much poorer than I grew up for any of the right ones to make it through that process, you know, like it is just practically takes winning a lottery ticket to win, to, to make it. And our society is really set up on this star system where you're either Kanye West, Lady Gaga, or you starve to death in the street. <laughs> and there's like very little for creative types. There is almost no middle ground. And you don't necessarily, like not everybody can support themselves selling paintings or being a recording artist, but to just have the, have the system meat grinder up all those, all those awkward kids, a few of them become superstars. And then all the, all of the other layers of society are the people who didn't have any kind of creative problem solving ability is a recipe for failure for our civilization. 
in my, my from my perspective that you literally just don't at the at the level of leadership and administration and you see this at the university you see this in academics like at, at the level of like politics at, across society you have people who only follow the steps and they can only mm-hmm. do something if somebody explains to them what the answer is and that's that's a problem that's the blind leading the blind. Like, you know, at some point somebody has to be visionary, even if they're not a painter, like they still have to be able to look forward and imagine what might happen and plan for it as opposed to just reacting to everything, which is, you know, I, my degrees in public administration, I'm basically trained to be a bureaucrat, you know, like, and bureaucracy is just purely reactive. You know, the earthquake comes, it knocks the buildings down, you put the buildings back up again. And you put them up the same way you did, and the earthquake comes and it knocks them down. And you put them back up again, and nobody thinks forward like, "Oh, well, let's build the buildings differently so they don't fall down when there's an earthquake." Since there's earthquakes here, <laughs> you know, yeah. like it has consequences across society, and like that creativity is just totally lacking in a lot of other fields. Like it, they they act like you are an alien when you come in with a creative background to most other fields. <laughs> they act. They, yeah. How do well, you do that? <laughs> Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, a lot of our alumni go on and do things that aren't um, directly related to the arts. I mean, uh, so I've seen them move out and do all sorts of, of different things, you know. So, yeah, people do kind of ebb and flow. And then, of course, there's a lot of students that take classes that they're major, you know, and their major is something entirely different. You know, they're doing the art because they wanted to to have that outlet, but at the same time, you know, sort of had parents that were, you know, kind of pushing them towards some sort of um, very specific, you know, degree with very specific job prospects and all of that stuff. And, you know, it's all understandable to me. And I, anytime I deal with a student, I just want them to have an appreciation for the arts, you know, when they leave my class, you know, whether they succeeded or failed, right, But whether it was easy or they struggled. You know, I think um, having people have an enriched understanding and appreciation for the arts is really important. Uh, in addition to what you're saying, which is just having an opportunity to kind of um, be engaged in different types of problem solving, you know, and different types of critical thinking um, that you just don't encounter in in uh, a lot of those sort of, you know, umbrella gen ed classes, you know, that kind of dominate uh, the high school and, and college scene. But, you know, for me, it was sort of like uh, I, just stum- I just kept stumbling forward, you know. So when <laughs> students tell me they're worried, I'm like, well, just... All you can do is, you know, move forward. Just keep, you know, it's, uh, you know, the past will present themselves, you know. And for a lot of them, it really is just, you know, because I see them and they're all, like, wound up. And then they graduate and I watch what they do. And, you know, so many of them really do flourish and start finding their path, you know, whether it be within the arts or not. Many of them uh, that I watch the most do continue on in the arts and, you know, have been... um, doing some really wonderful things, but, um, oh, that's really great. Yeah. I guess, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that within academia, that's the case. Uh, I think that if you make it to college and you're taking a, a elective art class on the side to get an appreciation for the arts and you're getting your business degree or whatever, like you probably have a pretty decent future ahead of you, but like there's, mm-hmm. there's, uh, I just feel like there's a huge untapped resource there out there in the broader site. Like, like, there's a lot of those introverted, thoughtful kids who don't make it into the arts, who don't make oh, yeah. it to academia, who are nonetheless like, 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 and they don't because they are at that age, they can't go out and represent their interests and maybe their parents don't value it. And like, they're falling through the cracks. That's the, to me, that's where we're missing them is, is like going from being the awkward teenager to, you know, going to school for anything and getting an appreciation for the arts or going to school for anything at all. And, you know, being that imaginative, thoughtful person and making it out and being successful, because if you're not, you know, if you don't go off to college at 18, the chances of you, you know, ever getting out of your job at in retail or working at a restaurant just goes down precipitously. And the world's a very treacherous place for people who are not very aggressive uh, at, if you're, you know, shy and introverted, uh, and you're an artistic type and you play acoustic guitar, you're trying to be a rock star, you know, like you're, you're going to have a bad time if you don't go through, uh, if you're not in the protected environment of the, so anyway, uh, we are 
uh, way over our time here. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got other stuff to stuff to do. I love talking to you, and I'd love to stay in touch with you and uh, you know continue our our dialogue and and uh, see where we uh, connect in the future. Connecting with the academic art world again is something that's been on my list of things to do for a while and, and you were the number one name on that list like as far as like i i want to get back in touch with some of my old professors i want to get in touch with some of my old fellow students and kind of reconnect with probably not going to go start taking our classes at nau again at this age but uh you know it's, <laughs> it's something that i miss hey you know i'm sure they do community open nights at places you know i mean we were talking about that life drawing thing you would be shocked at how many uh how many cities have like walk-in life drawing at and different have centers that, and galleries these days? Uh, here you know, in Naperville. No, no, ba- yeah, no back, no background required. Just walk in and you know draw for a couple hours. <laughs> On Sunday mornings, as, in Naperville. As, as good or as bad as you want, it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, we want to. I wanted to ask you before we finish. Uh, do you have any shows coming up or anything that you'd like to tell our listeners about? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I have, uh, I have three, well, I have a solo show up, up that's going to be up through uh, November in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania at the university there. Um, if you're in that area, I guess, uh, you could always catch it. Um, otherwise, uh, I have a, a solo show scheduled for March in uh, Denver, Colorado at Helicon Gallery. Uh, so if people wanted to see a big pile of work in person, I think my work looks a lot better in person. I mean, it, it's quite big, you know, most of it's bigger than people realize. And then it's coated in glitter. Half the stuff glows in the dark. I'm full oh, wow. of magical gimmicks. Yeah. People, people ooh and ah over that glitter, you know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it sparkles and it glows, but, um, so the work, I think, looks a lot better in person, so if people are there. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the summer, I have a solo show, actually, in uh, uh, in Australia. Oh, wow. In Melbourne, so I don't know if people will make it uh, to that one or not. <laughs> well, we are and, uh, and online, then, so. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and then, of course, that, that immediate uh, next uh, winter, so almost uh, – a year and a half from now, I have a solo show at Alma College in Michigan. So I got like four coming up, you know, so I'm just working to, to make it all happen. And then otherwise, I have work going out to a two-person or a small group show at um, uh, Arch Enemy Arts in Philadelphia and then work going out to a small group show in uh, California. But I can't remember the name of the space right now. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if people ever want to look at my website, there's normally um, – uh, I try to keep it update, you know, but now that I've moved on to social platforms, you know, the website actually seems a little bit antiquated. You know, I don't think people go uh, searching down websites for artists like they used to. You know, they they get used to just following them on social media. Before, I used to try to keep a blog and all sorts of stuff attached to my website, but then I realized, you know, my website traffic's really probably where I'm looked at the least. Uh, most people are seeing me, seeing my stuff more on Instagram and things like that. But on my website, I do keep a list of venues, which are upcoming shows, you know, so people can see like, oh, he has a show coming up at Fine Art Gallery, which is the one in Australia, um, and things like that. So if people uh, are interested in my work, you know, my website is probably the easiest way to find out where they could potentially see the work uh, in person, which I think is always a much better experience. That is Gallery. Correct. Yeah, and you and uh, I still have my old domain, which is mikereedy.com. It just reroutes them to that one. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but you know, if they typed in mikereedy.com, they'd get the same website. Okay. So. And then Instagram um, is under Michael Reedy at Michael Reedy. No, it's um, Michael Reedy Art. Michael Reedy. Michael Art. Reedy was already taken. Yeah, um, there's a million Michael Reedy. I noticed that. I a lot of us are. Yeah. The real estate I do agents. A whole lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I do a whole lecture on the Michael Reedies that aren't me uh, <laughs> on the first day of class. And uh, and there's an excellent Michael Reedy who tried out for Star Search uh, way back in the 80s with Ed McMahon. He's pretty pretty awesome. There's a Michael Reedy that's a composer down in Florida. He's the Michael Reedy I would be if I wasn't this Michael Reedy, you know, because he has a really awesome, like, face mole. And... <laughs> So there's tons of Michael Reedy's, and, and uh, yeah, I just Reedy have to be one of them. And <laughs> yeah, somebody beat me to Michael Reedy on Instagram, so Michael Reedy art. Thank you for joining us here on the Conscious Community Podcast. If you'd like more information about sponsoring this podcast or advertising with Conscious Community Magazine in print or online, 
please email me at spencerconsciouscommunitymagazine.com. That's S-P-E-N-C-E-R. Or call 630-492-0831. 